Hey, wonderful. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our event today on sales and pre-sales alignment. I'm super duper pumped to have everybody here. Um, we're going to get started in a couple of minutes here. Um, but first, for, um, before we do that, we're going to let folks kind of filter in here. Um, I think one of the things that we like to do to kind of like kick things off at, while folks are filtering in is just, you know, to get to know some of our panelists here today. We have a couple of really fantastic uh, sales engineering thinkers and sales enablement thinkers here. It's just kind of hear from them what their big next vacation is going to be here. Um, since I think all of us have been jonesing to do a little bit more traveling. Um, Gabriella, maybe we can start with you. What is your, uh, what's your big next uh, trip planning to be? Yeah, I've been waiting on it. I actually had like a New Year's 2020 going to Brazil a while back. And obviously we oh, all wow. know where that went. That went nowhere. Um, <laughs> so I'm very excited. Uh, so I'll be heading out there. I have a lot of uh, good friends that are Brazilian. So that's been something I've been dying to do. So hopefully um, pretty sometime hopefully sometime soon. I don't know how it is there right now, but hopefully in the next, within the next year, I'm hoping I'll, I'll have my fingers crossed until then. <laughs> Amazing. And Janelle, what's your big, uh, what's your big trip that you're looking to do next? Well, I had tickets to fly into Dublin at the end of November. I was going to spend Thanksgiving through Christmas, just kind of popping around different countries in Europe. And wow. I believe that was wishful thinking. So yeah. we'll see. We'll see what happens in the next couple of months. But there's a lot of quarantine requirements and it's just kind of a mess oh, trying wow. to get from one country to another. So I think I'm going to put a little a little hold on that. But hopefully that's going to be it. If, uh, if I'm not able to go, then I'll just go fishing in Key West for a couple of weeks and it'll be just as good. So. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a totally reasonable, uh, it seems like a totally reasonable backup. Consolation there. prize, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think probably the thing that I'm looking forward to doing is uh, bouncing out to New York. Um, we, uh, my wife is a graphic designer and kind of like a design and fashion person. We try to, you know, historically we try to get there you know, every three to four to five months. And it's kind of been a little bit of a problem in the last little bit there. Plus, you know, we have a atrium has a bunch of customers out there. I like to go and hang out with them. So I think that's the big, uh, the big one that I'm looking forward to doing here. TBD when that's actually going to happen, but I think that's kind of my primary, my primary goal. Um, wonderful. Well, I think we've got um, some folks here today, uh, the folks that are going to join us. So, hey, everyone, welcome to this fantastic uh, uh, event on sales and pre-sales alignment. Uh, my name is Pete Kazanji. I am the founder of, uh, of Modern Sales uh, and also, also Atrium. I'm uh, going to be your moderator here today, but obviously the, the people who are really, you're really here to see are Janelle and Gabriella. We'll get into them in a little bit here in a second, but I'm really excited about this topic because I know a lot about like sales operations, sales rigor, sales enablement, um, you know, sales analytics, things like that. Less so on the, uh, less so on the sales, uh, sales engineering uh, and pre-sales front. So I'm really excited to, to learn here today. Um, just for folks who are joining us, this is a, a modern sales event. Modern Sales Pros, of course, is the nation's largest uh, peer education community for sales operations, sales leadership, sales enablement, et cetera. Um, it exists to help people uh, advance their advance their state of the art with respect to their career and all those different uh, in all those different disciplines. And the way one of the ways that we do so is through fantastic events and learning, like uh, like the event that we're about to have here today. The community is made up of a who's who of uh, of amazing sales, um, you know, modern sales organizations. About twenty five thousand members, um, probably around like eight thousand distinct companies there, kind of, as you can kind of see here. But really, an amazing group of folks. And uh, for folks who are not members of the community yet, who are joining us for this event for the first time, you're going to get an invite after the uh, after the event today. Um, but none of this would be possible without the support of amazing modern sales um, solutions providers like the fine people at Prelay here, 
Um, so, so Gabriella, the founder of Prelay, is going to give us a little overview of what Prelay does before we get into the meat of our content here. So, so Gabriella, please. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Prelay overall just helps teams across the board from, you know, AEs to SEs to overall product specialists that might have to hop in, anyone that's involved on the deal to make sure that they're able to communicate and coordinate as quickly as possible, as easily as possible. As we all know, especially in a remote world, it's much harder these days to be able to really align on what's happening on the deal. So we really bring it together in one place, all tied back to all your core uh, tool sets as well. Wonderful. Yeah, doesn't it just happen in Slack? Yeah, no. <laughs> yep. That's where that's where everything Plenty gets lost. Of thoughts. Yep, that's, absolutely. That's where everything that's where everything goes to get lost. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, thank you for that. And um, and I think what I'm really excited about here today is we have a, a fantastic sales, technical sales enablement leader joining us in addition to Gabriella here. Um, Janelle, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and then um, and then Gabriella to follow? Sure. Um, hi everybody. I'm Janelle Todd. I am the global head of enablement for Logs.io. I cover enablement strategy for the entire revenue organization from SDRs all the way through partner and channels. Um, the early part of my career was spent on the front lines though. I started off as a Linux engineer and then I spent several years at AppDynamics as a sales engineer, which is where I made the transition into enablement. And I led the charge building the SE enablement programs, which took AppDynamics through their acquisition by Cisco. That's amazing. How many SEs did AppD have? I think I was SE number 62. And by the time I left, we had well over 250. Holy mackerel, right. And that was obviously like a huge competitive differentiator in terms of like being able to run much more complicated upmarket deals as compared to all the other kind of like APM vendors who were kind of like maybe stuck a little bit down here kind of in the in the SMD mid-market weeds. Um, a pretty pretty substantial competitive differentiator in order to have like an army of badass SEs. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about uh, about that. Um, Gabriella, maybe you can give a little give everybody a little bit of uh, of your background. Yeah, absolutely. So my past life was in the startup world, helping to scale out go to market teams. Overall, was obviously across the board from customer success to sales to really thinking through how are we enabling our teams to be scaling out these pretty large deals. And oftentimes that included technical enablement. And so that's really why I started Prelay was based upon just so many gaps and obstacles with mm -hmm. current solutions and um, really making sure that you can align the team as much as possible around that deal. So it's awesome now, obviously not only working on a micro level, but also now at a macro level, working with teams across the board from um, mid-market to enterprise companies to really think through how do they best scale out a lot of their enablement processes for um, and operations processes for enabling AEs and SEs to work together, enabling AEs and anyone else really that's involved in that deal process. So it's been uh, exciting to work with uh, each one of uh, the operations heads there and uh, yeah, excited to share a little bit more today. Totally. Um, wonderful. So what we're going to be getting into here is um, kind of our agenda is we have a couple of different topics that uh, Janelle and Gabrielle are going to going to take us through a little bit of housekeeping before we get into that. Um, folks, go ahead and use the Q&A panel on Zoom. It's like at the top or on the side. I forget exactly where it is from a UI standpoint, but um, but go ahead and drop questions in there if you want um, as we're jamming along here because um, Janelle and Gabriella will have uh, great answers <laughs> for them uh, obviously and um, you know and just to kind of let, let everybody know we'll send out the recording to everybody after the fact etc so you can kind of share it with your your teammates and and what have you there so you know so I think the first kind of topic that I wanted us to get into here was, you know, like, why is pre-sales kind of like sales and sales um, engineering alignment? Why is it such a tricky subject? And like, how did we, how did we kind of get to the state where we're, where we're at right now? And, and I think Gabriella, you had some kind of like, you know, background kind of context on that to share. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, I think taking a step back on it too, I think in general, 
everyone has their own goal around the deal. Everyone has their own agenda around how their team should be working around the deal. And I think that's the inherent problem is that a lot of it to date is siloed. It's um, mm -hmm. siloed goals around what you need to be achieving as an SE organization or a sales organization uh, for reps and everything. And how do you be, how are you able to also go ahead and execute upon that? And unfortunately, a lot of the enablements and everything then just focuses on, on these kind of siloed goals and siloed execution when in reality, a lot of it is collaborative. A lot of it is uh, really how are we best supporting that buyer or that customer as well. And um, I think that starts to really unravel a lot of truths around um, not really having any sort of visibility or even understanding of what your other team members are even doing internally, right? I think a lot of times people are kind of so focused on this revenue goal and so focused on what can I be achieving like individually or what can my team be achieving individually where you can't really take a step back of understanding what it, what are the other teams working on right now? How can I be helping out with that? How can I make sure that this deal is progressing throughout whether I'm a rep or I'm an SE? And I think that's the, the problem is that kind of lack of education, kind of lack of visibility. I think a lot of the foundational kind of items of building out what needs to be executed on, building out what core goals we need to be achieving has been just built out in silos, which now, as you can imagine, as organizations grow and grow from SMB to moving on to the enterprise level, it starts to compound in this kind of lack of visibility, lack of understanding how you can best helping, be helping out on the deal and everything of that sort. Um, and I think that as I'm you know, mentioning that too, I think one deal, like a deal, is not all the same, right? I think right. companies across the board, they have their smaller deals they're working. They have their much larger enterprise deals they're working and mm -hmm. getting a handle of how their teams can be working on that together is quite hard, right? You're always shifting maybe your product lines. You're always shifting how uh, you could be running the deal in the best way possible for depending on the teams, what your, your team makeup looks like. And um, mm -hmm. I think that's where it really comes into play as well, where hard to really facilitate this on the go. And oftentimes it kind of gets, uh, it catches up with people over time as um, you can't really think through how that segmentation, how that execution should be happening around that segmentation. And overall, what are the key goals that we should be achieving as a team, not just for those individual um, team members as well. So I think that taking a step back from like that underlying like foundational problem that's coming into play because everyone's been working in silo state internally. I think oftentimes for reps and, you know, SE specifically, it's that lack of understanding of the product that typically, you know, has an SE hop, hop in, maybe lack of understanding what technically should be happening as we're configuring a solution. And so what I really urge is really making sure that how can we start to think through how reps can be facilitating more or at least collaborating with more and really understanding how, why and how are the SEs kind of hopping into this process? How can I make sure that that's being run in the best way possible so that this deal that's not just mine, it's across the team um, can really be propelling for it as well. So um, definitely lots of thoughts on this end, but I think uh, the underlying motions, unfortunately, have really caught up to, I would say, software organizations across the board. And now I think it's really time for people to really think through how can they best enable and operationalize a lot of just how their teams work together, especially for reps and SEs, is that's one of the key partnerships that happen internally for sure. Got it. And then, so Janelle, I know that, um, you know, as a practitioner who, as you noted, was, SE number 60 at, uh, at APT and then, you know, scaled up to 250. And then how many SEs are there at, uh, logs? Is it logs IO? I want to logs make sure I'm pronouncing it yeah. at log at logs IO. How many SEs are there now? I'm leading a much smaller sales team right now. Uh, we have somewhere around, I believe we just hired our eighth sales engineer. So much, wow. much smaller team. It allows me to spend a lot more time one-on-one -on -one with them. Yeah. But so obviously you've been a practitioner, both an individual and then also enabler at, you know, a huge, huge SE organization now at a much kind of like a much smaller one. Um, you know, how, why is this alignment 
topic so so tricky for um, especially in your in your situation, you're doing sales enablement across SDR, AE, and and SE. What like what leads to kind of these challenges? Well, my knee-jerk reaction as a former practitioner is to say that sales engineers tend to be the unsung heroes of the deal process, right? Um, I think there's <laughs> often this battle between AEs and sales engineers on who actually does the most work during the deal process, you know, who's actually closing <laughs> the deal here. When the truth is, you know, we can't do our jobs without the other. So I think that the, the misalignment and some of the issues that we're facing comes down to, to three main things. It's going to be process, um, the, the way we determine how we utilize our SDs, and then yep. the skill level of the AEs themselves. So when it comes to the process, we have to be sure that we are very, very clear and intentional about the roles and responsibilities. When are we actually going to be bringing an SE into the deal? Um, mm -hmm. And that leads right into my second point, which was how are we using the SEs? Are we using them as a step in the sales process? Like is giving a demo a step in your sales process? Or are you using demonstrations more as a tool to move you through the full on cycle? And then lastly, of course, this is a dream state, but all of the sellers that, that, are, that are working should have be some level of a sales engineer, right? Successful sellers are going to be the ones that invest in product knowledge. I think that we can all, including AEs, agree that product knowledge is definitely king. And at some point in time, we have to make sure that the AEs are well-versed enough in the product to have confident conversations from the beginning through right. the end without having to bring in a sales engineer, you know, every few minutes, that's going to really help us best utilize our, our SEs. Got it. Excellent. Yeah. I think the, the, the challenge that I've run into as a sales leader there is what is the, from a product knowledge standpoint, like what's the bright line of these are the things that we expect our AEs to know. Yep. Right, and be able to answer these questions mm -hmm. like quickly. Uh, and then what are the things where it's like, okay, to kind of tap out, right? And kind of like snapping that line there. Um, and obviously it's gonna be a fuzzy line, um, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but to the extent that you have account executives who need to kind of pull an, pull an SE in anytime there's something that's like just directly a little bit like technical, well, that's obviously going to elongate your sales cycles. Oh, and you know, let's get another meeting going on. Let's play calendar hockey, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those are, you know, those are, those are, those, that's kind of the biggest challenge that I've run yeah. into um, I, there. One comment there is that I think that really comes into play with that lack of visibility of really understanding, you know, overall how the reps are looping in that SE, what type of questions are they asking them? Uh, what type of activities are they asking of them? And oftentimes that leads you to believe that, oh, we actually need to create this enablement material so they can start to understand mm -hmm. this product more. Right. We need to have more product training on that end so we can actually start to boost up this product line during the sales process before we bring in that SE. So I definitely agree for sure. Right. So rather than rather than that SE kind of involvement being invisible and like ephemeral, mm -hmm. and and as a result, we don't then understand like, oh, actually, there there's an opportunity for ten, like you know, FAQ cards or whatever that would then blow away like fifty percent of our meeting of like our our SE meetings or what have you. If that's invisible, we can't do that. So make it visible, and then all of a sudden we can start refining that and, and building building materials and what have you. Yeah, totally. Um, and then you start to shift from that tactical piece to that more strategic level of how SEs can be really coming into the deal process for sure. As opposed to being kind of like FAQ regurgitators. Like, yeah, hey. exactly. <laughs> I think this meeting could have been substituted with like a flashcard. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Yeah, that seems like a good uh, move. Moving from very expensive SDs, essentially regurgitating FAQs, to uh, to kind of more strategic involvement and spending time kind of doing more custom uh, builds and what have you. Um, okay, mm -hmm. cool. So those are the challenges. So let's talk a little bit about like how to solve them, right? And kind of think about some of these first principles of um, of alignment there. And I think kind of the topics that we wanted to get into here was kind of like handoff process, 
like rules of engagement when you're allowed to get an SE, when you're not allowed to get an SE, uh, and then like how to how to approach this from a crawl, walk, and then run standpoint. Um, Janelle, given the fact that you've been closest to this for your career, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Yeah. You know, this is a challenge that I think every every organization faces, and it's one of the main things that I've been trying to work through here, especially with the the maturity level of our sales team and the number of sales engineers that we have. I mentioned right. that it's really important that the sellers are able to to understand enough about the product to be able to have confident, clear conversations with a customer and not have to drag an SEM during the discovery process. I think that. Right. Um, that the first thing is is addressing that that process gap. So where exactly are we going to be bringing a sales engineer in on the deal? And that takes a lot of buy-in from sales leadership in order to enforce that utilization. Look, one of the right. things that we're doing right now is building out a set of qualification criteria that says, have you already answered these things? What is it that the, that the SE actually needs to do? Like, what, what are you looking for from the sales engineer before you bring them in? And we need to have these questions answered before you can hand this information to an SE and say, you know, can you please join this call? So it, the reason what, that I... Um... Sorry, what, what would be some like tactical examples of that just for like, you know, the kids at home watching you here, like what are some of the like tactical examples of like, you don't get to talk to an SE unless you give us these criteria right here. Like what would be some examples of how, how like what folks would want to do there to enforce good utilization? I would say it's pretty much some of the basics. Do you understand yeah. the problems that this customer is trying to solve? Um, do you know what their tech stack is? Uh, what competitors have they been investigating and who have they already been using? It, it really comes down to the second one, though, is what, what's the problem that we're trying to solve here? What's the question that, that's being asked of us? And you know, the reason why we need to establish this qualification criteria is because sales engineers' calendars tend to be completely bogged down. Mm -hmm. So we really need to, to set that qualification criteria to say an SE shouldn't be joining unless we have X, Y, Z. And it, it's not just about alleviating the calendars from a sales engineering perspective either. It's also about making sure that we're showing our best face to our customers. Um, some of the most frustrating calls that I'd ever been on as a sales engineer was when I would jump on what essentially turned into another discovery call. And you could feel right. that frustration mm -hmm. about the customer. And they're yeah. like, I already answered this. Or, you know, how come this wasn't asked during the first call? When do I actually get to the demo? And oftentimes without that information, it pushes you into a premature demo where you're just like, all right, let me show you what we can do without That's understanding right. what you want to see. The, the old Harbor Cruise demo. And on the left, <laughs> oh, over here, we have this. And on the right, over here, we have this. Is any of this resonating? Because I have no idea what your pain points are. Exactly. <laughs> just like throw, just throwing darts. So, okay. Identified use case, you know, tech stack, you know, the, the kind of like existing, like existing, um, you know, competitors looked at, et cetera, et cetera. So like making that really clear mm -hmm. such that then the SE can come in and be like, so it's my understanding that A, B, and C, is that yeah. right? Yeah, that's totally right, Janelle. All right, cool. Like, let's get into it. Okay. Yeah. Makes, um, makes, makes sense. And so um, I think you had a comment about SE involvement in the POC process versus the the kind of discovery process there making sure that there was kind of good separation there did you want to ex, you know expound on that a little bit yeah so i think that that when it comes to running your sales process you know obviously we all try to create a process that we can very tightly adhere to and when it comes to discovery versus when you bring in a sales engineer i feel like there, there has to be a very clear moment when it's time for the sales engineer to enter the stage. And it's after you get those beginning, you know, basic sets of qualification material. So, I mean, and right. this is not, you know, groundbreaking, groundbreaking news or advice that I'm giving. These are all very basic things that everyone should have before they start talking to the tech side. And yeah. so I feel like the, when it comes to discovery, that's something that should be handled specifically by the account executive. And the reason totally. why is so that we can prepare a personalized demo for the for the sales engineer to walk through. Like you said, no Harbor Cruise demos. Nobody wants to see that. Um, and I think this also goes back to the type of product that you're selling. For us, yep. we 
began the business as a very technical product for a very technical buyer. And right. our, our account executives are not prepared necessarily to have super technical conversations. So while I don't want to turn them into almost engineers, I, I do want to make sure that they're able to handle at least some adequate discovery without having the sales engineer involved from the very beginning, from the first call. Um, yeah. If we, if we can make that, that delineation between what, what are we getting out of a discovery call and then what are we getting out of the actual POC process, the demo, if it's yep. a step or a tool, you know, I feel like if we have a very, very clearly defined roles and responsibilities between who's doing what, it's going to make the, the customer experience the best possible. We don't want to frustrate them. We want to move them through the, the uh, deal cycle as quickly as possible. Um, and you can only do that if everyone knows exactly what it is that they should be doing at that point in time, instead of kind of throwing the ball back and forth. Right. And also it's like a highest and best use of time thing that we were kind of talking about earlier. Like it, uh, SE shouldn't be spending his or her time you know, being a FAQ regurgitator, uh, SE shouldn't be spending time doing doing disco. SE should be spending time, you know, send setting up custom demo instance, Correct. right? Or like, you know, tuning things up to like demonstrate like specific requirements that you know that have been identified in um, in Discover because like those are things that only only they can do versus you know the the discovery stuff and then. Gabriella, I know that um, I think you had some comments on this around kind of like how this precipitates in the enterprise, you know, um, specifically. Mm -hmm. Did you want to um, kind of expand on that? Yeah, for sure. And I think one comment just to make on what you all were just mentioning on like overall mm -hmm. involving the SE thoughtfully, I think that context switch is massive here, right? I think especially as you're wanting them to dig into these very in-depth activities, for them to have to content switch between, you know, these small questions, these large activities, that sure. starts to add up over time of really not being as productive as possible. So really being thoughtful around that of those roles and responsibilities there will be really helpful on that end too, from just like a productivity standpoint. Um, mm -hmm. And I think go going kind of further down the list of, you know, from discovery down to, like further in that POC period, I think that's oftentimes where we really find that there's this huge gap and kind of information sharing of mm -hmm. what does this customer and buyer actually need, right? Like if we're spending so right. much time on this POC and we're spending so much time on really starting to build out this case, how on the SE end can I really be driving forth with that value as well as we're going through this very lengthy process of maybe a POC or a POV, whatever it might be. And really on that end, I think really being able to pair that discovery with why we're really going through with the buyer or customer in one place is really helpful there. Um, so we're really yeah. guiding them through this process around ensuring that we are driving value that's actually helpful to them and really tied to what they're looking for, especially if it's a bake off, we need to be really aligning on that front. And oftentimes, again, I think it's a huge limitation when I, we've seen it oftentimes where reps and SEs will have no idea what that success criteria or that success point even looks like for post POC. Right. And having that alignment from that discovery piece to POC is really helpful there, especially as you're just mentioning on, you know, that enterprise front as you're working through this POC that could be months at a time, you always have to be reminding the buyer why we're even spending time here and why we're even right. really building out this, you know, massive solution. Um, and so that value piece, I think, is a really great tie-in for AEs and SEs to really work together. But I think, unfortunately, it's a massive benefit to that. But I see so many organization, organizations time and time again, just letting it be siloed and I, again, I think that's a really great proof point to be proving out to the buyers that you're even aligned internally as to why they should be purchasing your product and everything. And yeah. obviously that customer buy, buying experience is super key here around making sure that they are happy and they're excited to be hopping in as a customer and really understanding the value that they'll be getting as well. Um, and I think it goes back to two around the, you know, I mentioned a little bit earlier around like the strategic versus kind of tactical end, um, how do we make sure that we really think through like that segmentation of that like 
really line that should be crossed um, from an AE to SE perspective. How are we really ensuring that is even clear from how you're running an enterprise deal versus a like more mid market deal? Obviously, with the enterprise, maybe a SE might have to come in involved a little bit further down the line, a little bit earlier in the in the process. But what is, how much help do they need to be providing? Like, what is that depth of help? And like, you know, I think roles and responsibilities are helpful and start kicking that off. And then how do you go to that next level of, you know, how in depth does the SE really have to get in this engagement and that activity as well? Because um, with these enterprise deals, as you can imagine, there's so many things that go on and so many moving parts. How can you make sure it's really clear as to how far and how much time the SE needs to take on this one deal, let alone these multiple deals that they're also helping out on. So I think that really starts to help out a lot on that productivity end as well, really making sure that um, the SEs really spending their time in the right deals on the right activities, and also making sure they're aligned with that, you know, buyer and customer and the rep um, throughout the process. Yeah, I think the the notion of what, a great book that I read recently um, by John McMahon, uh, the qualified sales leader. So John was um, CRO at a PTC, so parametric technology back in the day. And so he's one of the godfathers of, um, of Medic, Medic, MedPick, blah, blah, blah. You know, what? choose your flavor, right? And this notion of, we, um, we kind of talk about it in our sales organization of like identified use cases that then pair to the the solution, right? And because you know, in a complicated solution like um, that, they can, or sorry, a, a powerful solution that can handle many different use cases. You might have three, six, ten different use cases, kind of like a menu of use cases that um, that your solution can be used to to resolve. And so, identifying what the use case is, saying, hey. These are the two you, in the discovery process. Hey, we really care. Like we're, I, I imagine this is like something that Janelle runs into all the time. Like, hey, we're, we're paying Splunk ungodly amounts of money and we want to like reduce our, our spend on, on that right here. Okay, well, that sounds like a really important use case right there. And then later on, what we're going to do is we're going to tie specific features and to solve that right there. And and so carrying that along, we at our in our organization we call these vases and and bouquets. So like an, an empty vase, like needs flowers in it, right? So you identify the the vase and say, hey, here's this thing, it's like it needs to be filled, and then and then you fill it with like the the relevant features, and so that you might have a handful of different vases there. But if you then show up and you're like, hey, why are we here again? It's like, oh well, you delineated to us that you're spending this amount of time. And, and energy on your um, elk stack, for instance, I would imagine is something else that like Logs.io kind of contends like you 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 have a you have this many engineering time that you're being that, that's like managing your your log management system, and it's a huge pain in the butt, and like you have people who depart, and then like that information goes out the out the window, and and you guys want to alleviate that, and you've measured the fact that it's probably about this amount of money that you're spending per year in order to do that, and that's why we're here today, and then always kind of coming back to that and saying like by the way as a reminder. This is the big thing that we're, we're seeking to solve. And so carrying that forward rather than having to like rediscover it every single time ends up being really, really powerful such that the, you know, when, when you get to that technical, and there was a question on this, like POC, POV, proof of concept, proof of value, essentially the demonstration of solution in order to say, look, this is the risk. You should pay us $500,000. You should pay us a million dollars because you're going to get this value, value back. But making sure that that identified use case or use cases comes along for the ride um, and doesn't get lost sight of is is really really important, which I think is kind of you know a big principle here of making sure that that's documented and aligned around so it's going to be carried forward. Um, wonderful. So so this has kind of changed over time with kind of like the advent of different tooling and kind of like different processes and and what have you. What you know what advice would you both give? to sales leaders to help alleviate these kind of like technical pre-sale alignment, uh, technical sales, non-technical uh, non sales alignment issues in a pre-sale environment. Janelle, what, 
what kind of like what what advice would you give to sales leaders who are maybe contending with some of these these issues that we've been discussing so far? Well, as you can imagine, as an enabler, I have a lot of opinions on that. All <laughs> but kinds. I'll, try to, I'll try to distill them down. Um, so <laughs> when I first started creating enablement programs and and learning how to align non-technical sellers and technical sellers, I used uh-huh. to approach it from the perspective of how can I arm them with the right product knowledge? And over time, my position on that has morphed into how can I teach both of them how to deliver the best experience for the customer? I think one, instilling right. the attitude of being very customer centric into both of them is, mm-hmm. is key. Um, and when it comes to the enablement side of things, my original principles were making sure that you're getting the right information to the right audience at the right time. But there's also another key aspect to that, and that's having the right instructor. For instance, mm. we we may want to teach um, maybe like a, a sales skill like that. I would say, okay, for instance, we want to teach product knowledge to a non-technical seller. Well, Mm -hmm. having someone like a product engineer is probably the wrong person to teach that class. We want to have someone that is an established and experienced enterprise seller who's been on the front lines and knows how to talk about the product. Because what what I always push into my seller's brains is that customers don't care what we can do. They care what we can do for them. So it's really about, uh, about how, we, how we're teaching the sellers in order to, to have a conversation around the problems that we solve in that way. So we have to be very clear in you know, who is actually teaching these classes, the type of information that we're getting to them, when are we getting it to them? And I think that there has to be very, very close alignment through training. There's, we talked a lot about discovery a little bit earlier. So as an example, there, there is a discovery level that an AE will do, but there's also additional discovery that a sales engineer will sure. do. So how do we go even deeper into the things that we're learning about our customer? So we have to make sure that, that everyone understands what the other is doing. And that comes all the way back to being very, very clear in your sales process. What's my role? What's my responsibility? But I also need to know what you're doing. You know, what, what questions have you already asked? What information have you gotten? What's the next step? How can I help you with that? It's, and in the past, when I've been paired with a, an account executive, the most successful relationships that I had was when we were in lockstep about what was coming next. And the least successful ones were where we were repeating each other's efforts or, you know, the, right. I'll say the account executive would drop off the moment we started talking about technical things. You really have to make sure that you are having your sellers you need to participate in every step, even though it might not be the, the step that they're leading. And then of wow. course, lastly, prioritizing enablement. Um, I think that it's easy to kind of brush it to the side and say, I'll do that during my free time. But actually taking your training and investing the time in your enablement, that is what is going to get you that closed deal at the end of the day. So we have to make sure, and this is something that I ask my sales leadership all the time is, can we make sure that we are prioritizing at least a couple of hours a week to do this? Put it on their calendar, make sure they're doing it. And of course you wanna make sure that you are able to to monitor that. So you have to make sure you have a, a really good LMS in place. Are we able to prove that the programs that I'm creating are um, actually effective. And, but, you know, coming full circle, I think that it's really just about making sure that we are training the same way. We're aware of each other's jobs. And at the end of the day, making sure that we are delivering a good experience for the customer and thinking about them and not ourselves. Yeah. Well, Gabrielle, I know that a lot of customers, a lot of prelay customers use prelay to help facilitate that coordination and make sure man repeating each other's work is just like talk about just setting salary expense on fire right janelle um what are some of the best ways that um that folks that your customers are doing in order to ensure that alignment make sure that people aren't stepping on each other's toes or even i mean they're stepping on each other's toes but then there's like redoing each other's work which is like Mm -hmm. um what are what are some great ways that um that you've seen your customers kind of up their game there yeah i mean i think even um while kicking off with prelay oftentimes we find that people are even just trying to educate themselves of oh, our SE leaders are doing it this way or our SE team is doing it that way. That's 
That's interesting. I've not heard of this quite yet. And so that's really uh, where I find that it's actually really useful to understand what are those goals that the SE team is actually holding on to? And what are those mm -hmm. core, like important process sets they're trying to run and really implement with the, within the team? So from a, I think a sales leadership perspective, like understanding that underlying kind of, um, you know, process that they're running and goals that they're running, I think is for one, super important to even start as like a, you know, initial point in the process. Um, I think from there, it's really just starting to think through and mapping out like, how do we want this to look? Like what are what is best practices in our eyes when we're selling that maybe particular use case you were, you were mentioning, Peter, maybe that selling that particular segmentation as well in the enterprise, how do we want this working? And I think unless you have that initial conversation across the team, especially between SE leader and sales leader, it's really hard to start to define a lot of these roles and responsibilities unless you really start to dig into the execution and how you all are actually doing things. So. I think really starting to understand the day-to-day -day there on more on the SE side from that sales side is going to be really helpful to start to understand those actual insights as to how you can start to align this across the board. And obviously within Prelay, then you can start to take it to that next level of actually executing this across the board between AE to SE to AE to anyone else that's really involved in the deal process. So that you aren't, you know, yeah, duplicating the process. You're making sure you're aligned around those customer goals and really aligned as to who needs to be involved when and how can they be the most useful during the process as well. So um, I think it's just understanding those people you're working alongside of the deal with as much as possible. And I think starting with leadership and trickling down from there, just setting that example of really respecting the process that the SEs are running and respecting those goals they're running and making sure that's aligned is going to be the key there to start to kick off and really get to that next level of um, execution and obviously really starting to uh, speed up that deal process too. I love it. Um, wonderful. Well, we have a couple of Q&A that kind of showed up here that I thought we could, we could get into. Um, kind of first kind of question on the topic of like crawl, walk, run. Um, you know, when, when you guys think about how to make sure the, you know, the, the sales organization is following through on some of the best practices that you all shared today, what, what would be kind of like the, like the number one thing and then the number two thing and then the number three thing that they, that folks should be, um, that folks should be doing in order to like follow through on, on some of this, um, Janelle, do you kind of have like from a prioritization standpoint, what are the most important things that the folks can do in order to like hit the ground crawling at least, not running necessarily, but just to get started? Um, well, I, I'm not really sure about, you know, order of operations and how I would, how I would recommend it because for me, I tend to work backwards on, you know, what is actually your current state of affairs and then how do we start to address the, the different things that you're experiencing. But I would say that, you know, again, first and foremost, make sure that you're investing in your enablement so that each of the roles has a sufficient amount of product knowledge in order to be able to participate in the different steps in the process. Um, the, the second thing is making sure that we are very, very clear on what our process is. Uh, when an SE is supposed to come in and exactly what type of information they're supposed to be gathering. And then like Gabriella said earlier, how, how do we make sure that you are, you are performing your role sufficiently to be able to, to, to get you through the deal as quickly as possible. Um, those are really my, my top two things I would say is just making sure that you have that, that customer centric style of, 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 of engaging with your with your customers, whether you're an AE or an SE, and that may, that means being in lockstep with each other. Gabriella, do you have anything to want to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I think on my end, I think every product is different, every person's different, every company is different, and I think in the end, like starting those conversations at least around how can we be best running this process? Because oftentimes that's the thing that's kind of left behind is even just taking off that conversation is going to be helpful. And I, I completely agree is really thinking through what are the core kind of goals we have of potential, um, you know, improvements we can be making. And that really, again, comes down to how does our product work? How should we be selling this? Because again, I think sales processes are all, um, there's some alignment pieces across the board, across companies that in the end, 
every product ha has its own flavor. And so how do you really start to think through um, that for your own company and for your own teams as well? And having those conversations and starting to really map out the process there, I think is going to be the most helpful. Yeah, excellent, 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 excellent. And then I guess the second one um, here, because I think one of the things that we had talked about at the very, very, very beginning of this was like, we want to understand that we're getting highest and best use out of our out of our SEs. And so often thought what that means is like making sure that like SEs aren't being used for like a bunch of kind of like low value BS, which would means like, how do we get visibility into how the SEs are are being utilized by by AEs? Like, is it are they being used as like FAQ regurgitators or, or what have you. So like, yeah, what are, what are good ways that you guys have seen for organizations to get visibility into how AEs are leveraging SEs? Gabriella, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think a huge portion here is how can you really pair that execution with gathering those insights, right? I think there's always ways you can add a field on Salesforce or something to try to get like yeah. high level quick insight. But I think in the end, it's how do you really pair um, the execution and the process you're trying to run with what your reps and your SEs and everyone that's involved in the deal, what they're actually doing day to day. So you can actually gather those insights of truly, what is that SE helping out on? Is that quick question something that they actually covered two weeks ago that we could have yeah. actually covered within uh, a tool like Prelay where you'd have that full repository of information or Right. Overall, how, how do you start to understand even just in general for these POCs or anything else that you're having the team run through in that larger process? How are they actually getting involved in the process? How, how is that process running? And unfortunately, you know, I think oftentimes you're kind of running in Slack and Teams and some docs to date. Um, we're getting those insights, I think, in real time is going to be really helpful in understanding um, you know, how you can be best running a lot of this kind of overall alignment between your team. But until then, it's you know, kind of up in the air. You don't really have some light visibility, but it's really hard to start to pinpoint where the problems are potentially at and how you can best enable your team as well. Janelle, how do you, how do you tackle this, get visibility into that, you know, what, what SEs are being unbundled into, what, what they're being eaten alive by on their calendar? So because currently I, I'm dealing with a much smaller team and I work one-on-one -on -one with them frequently, most of the, the information that I get is just word of mouth and then also monitoring Slack channels, right? This is not always, right. uh, it, it's not scalable, that's for sure. Um, over at AppDynamics, like I said, we had hundreds of sales engineers and most of them were <laughs> partnered with an AE. Now, the problem yep. that runs into these larger teams is that eventually you have these, these partnerships, these pairings of AEs and SEs that there's groups that become very successful and it's very clear who you know the all-star partnerships are. And that kind of right. leaves you know, other people in the background and makes them less successful. It makes them you know, not the, the go-to people per se, even though they might be a really strong SE with kind of a weaker AE partner or vice versa. So I think the way to get around that is to make sure that you're, you're training them in very, very close alignment. Every single uh -huh. program that I build has role-based fundamentals, but it all starts from core foundations. So are we running uh, the process the same way? Do we understand the steps? Do we understand our roles? And then we break out into role-based fundamentals where we can talk about you know, deep dive product knowledge or advanced demos for sales engineers, and then more soft skills or um, discovery methods for account executives. So I think that it, it all comes back to that alignment and being very clear on what we're supposed to be doing for each other. Love it, love it. Um, so this has been a really fantastic tour de force of uh, you know, alignment, pre-sales alignment, uh, best practices and kind of like what the root causes are of those of those issues. If we wanted to summarize, you know, the takeaway, a, a tweet length takeaway for the for the audience here, um, how would you do it? And I think for me, probably the biggest step, the biggest takeaway that I've heard here is kind of um, rules of engagement and and kind of entry and exit criteria. Who's responsible for which part? of the of the process and like what is the who's responsible for which part of the process and when is it 
able to move out of sales land into SE land, just being very crisp around that, having that well documented, and then understanding exactly where each deal is in that process will lead to really, um, will remove a bunch of brain damage and like, you know, sweat and tears. Um, Janelle, what what would kind of be your uh, your your biggest takeaway here? Um, I would say my biggest takeaway there's there's a couple of things, and of course we're doing tweet level, so I'll keep it super short. Um, yeah. One is going to be to invest in the the technical skill level of your account executives. In the future, I think we're all going to be moving towards trying to find and hire those deal oriented AEs that can also speak more to the technical side. That's what's going to help you utilize your sales engineers to the best of their abilities and keep their calendars pretty clean. Uh, But most importantly, make sure that you are very clear and intentional about the process that you're running and who's doing what. I really think that that's that's the the be all and end all. The foundation of having a good partnership is to make sure that people know how, how they can work best in tandem with each other. Wonderful. Yes. It sounds like weird alignment. We keep coming back to it. And then uh, Gabriella, what, what would kind of be your biggest takeaway on this? Yeah. I mean, I think on the internal end, obviously that alignment between A and SE is crucial, but I think one thing we're missing there is just the customer journey. How are we aligning around that customer journey and really think through how we can be driving value throughout and I, I think, again, that's uh, time and time again, something that's missed out on. So I think really driving uh, that uh, customer centric uh, approach is incredibly important for sure. So it all comes back to the customer. I, uh, I love it. Well, wonderful. So I told you that time was going to fly when you have people who know their, their knitting like this. Um, I want to say thank you to Gabrielle and Janelle for. Um, dropping knowledge so substantially today. I feel that I know way more about uh, <laughs> pre-sales alignment than I did um, than I did before. Um, low bar, at least for me, but I imagine that even people who were <laughs> more expert um, came away with a bunch of great stuff. Uh, and then also wanted to thank Prelay for uh, underwriting this. Uh, obviously, the MSP community is powered by the all the events that we're able to do and all the events managers that we have executing there is powered by and underwritten by our wonderful partners. Uh, and so we're really excited that uh, that Prelay partnered with us in that regard. Uh, if you want to check out upcoming events, you can do this. We do obviously um, you know, a handful of these events, uh, about a half dozen of these events per week. Um, you can check that out on our website at modernsaleshq.com. And as noted, um, we'll be sending out a um, kind of a synopsis of the key takeaways from, from the event today, along with the recording to, um, to attendees and registrants. All of the prior um, all the prior recordings of these various events are also present on our website as well. So you can go over to that website and check it out, our website and check it out and, and get into the, the details and get into the guts of our expansive historical library there. So um, team, thank you very much. Janelle, Gabriella, it was absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope everybody has a great rest of their week. Thanks, Pete. Thanks again. Thank you. Yep. Okay, take care guys.